Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. You know, I've just had uh, burdens and thoughts on my heart the last several days that have just been very persistent. And, uh, you know, coming out of the service Wednesday night and then going on through the next couple of days, you know, particularly on Friday, I, I just had one word that kept coming back to my mind over and over and over again. It was the word stand. And then I came into the prayer meeting Friday night and as I began to share, you know, Patty shared something right off the bat. I mean, she couldn't just put it exactly into words. <laughs> the very thing that I'd been thinking about was how many situations, how many battles, how many, how many things does the Lord want to do, and, he, and yet we have a vital part to play in the work of the Lord. And uh, how many times do we sort of take a stand and then we back down and we, we're sort of a little bit uncertain and... Uh, so I don't know, I just want to try to share some thoughts uh, in this area, and I've had so many that they could never fit into a message, so I'm just going to ask the Lord to pull out of this uh, failing memory here. But he's, he's good about doing that, isn't he? He can do what he wants, and he's the one that we need. Uh, you know, obviously when you, uh, when you mention a, a word and a theme like that, your mind immediately goes to Ephesians 6 that we've used so many times, but you know, the Lord can bring out something fresh. And uh, just because you've done something doesn't mean you're just kind of going through the motions and, and talking about a scripture. I believe there's a certain thing that the Lord has on his heart this morning. And, you know, as I thought about the, uh, the, the wonderful passage where we're told to stand against all the, the tricks the devil pulls and we're told to put on the whole armor and, and stand in the evil day and all of that, um, you know, there's a reason, I believe, that that passage is where it is in the book. It's at the end. And the thing that I believe we need to see always when we think about this particular passage is to see it in the context of what Paul has, writing, has been writing. Because it isn't just something he drops in as a separate standalone thing. It's part of the flow of thought. And many times my, my mind has gone back to a book that I read, a small book. And I guess I was the age of a lot of you young people when I read it. Uh, but it was by Watchman Nee, and most of you probably have at least heard the name Watchman Nee. He was a, uh, a much blessed, world famous Christian leader in the Chinese church during the first half of the 20th century. He was born in, I, I sort of looked up his quick uh, summary of his biography, and I'm glad I did because there's one thing that jumped out at me. But he was born in, in 1903 in a nominally Christian home. Now, you know what nominally Christian means is they professed to be Christian in, in religion, but there wasn't any reality to it. And I'm afraid we got far too much of that in America, but uh, the Lord knows them that are his, doesn't he? But in any case, when he was about 17, he had no real interest in the Lord, but there was a uh, revival service, revival series of meetings, evangelistic really, uh, that were being held, and his mother went, and after she came home that night, she came to him and apologized for something that she had either said or done that she had felt convicted about. And, and her apology touched something in him. There, it, it, act, it did something to his heart and it, it woke something in him that caused him to go the following night. And uh, so he did and afterwards he was just wrestling with himself. Am I gonna, you know, am I gonna surrender? Am I gonna put my faith in Jesus? And as he thought about it, suddenly, um, I, boy, this breaks me up thinking about it. I have to stop and catch myself. But suddenly, he just saw in his heart, his, his mind was open to the fact, to the enormity of his sins, and he just was aware of the depth of his need. But at the very same time, he saw in his mind's eye the Savior with his arms nailed out to the sides, being punished for his sins. But then he saw that scene in a different light, and he saw the arms of the Savior reaching out and saying, I'm welcoming you, come. And, you know, his heart just melted with, that, with the reality of that revelation. You know it takes that? You can't explain people into the kingdom of God. God has got to deal with the heart. 
And that was, a, that was a perfect example of a case where God just touched this man's heart. And he evolved into a teacher who, because he traveled in the West and wrote some things, uh, he became world, world famous. Uh, he went through all the deprivations of, uh, of World War II, but there was a, a significant, a widespread church movement that he started that was very real. And uh, of course, when the communists took over, they didn't take too kindly to him, and so they trumped up a bunch of charges and threw him in prison in 1952, supposedly for 15 years. And uh, that sentence never ended until he died in 1972. But I'll tell you, a great man of God, most of the books that are out there are actually note from notes taken from his teachings. And that particular one that keeps coming back to my mind is called Sit, Walk, Stand. I've referred to it before. And it's a perfect outline of the book of Ephesians. Because before we can stand, something else has got to be in place. We can talk about how we're supposed to stand and do this and all and that, but if, unless we really get the rest of the book and understand what's, really go, what's behind us, what's going on with all of this, we don't have a lot to stand on. We can talk, the, we can say the words, but the truth is we need a different attitude, a different spirit when we're talking about the, the, uh, the battles, the spiritual battles that we fight because we do have a kingdom of darkness that is in control of this world system. It's a raid against us. It fights every day against every one of us. But, the, but, but are we in a position of weakness or are we in a position of strength? And that's, uh, you know, that was the first part because until we get the sit part, none of the rest of it makes any sense. And the essence of that is basically you start from the beginning and just kind of summarize what it's talking about. You know, we begin with an eternal purpose of God. We begin with God doing something. We begin with him reaching out in mercy to us and doing it not because we deserve something, but because he had a loving heart and a purpose that was for his pleasure to have a kingdom that was eternal. And not only has he uh, had that purpose in mind, but he has declared that there is coming a day when everything is going to come together. He has elevated his son to a position of of authority and rule above every other rule in the, uh, in the universe. Of course, he goes into that later in chapter 1. But he's also declared that there is going to be a day. This is in chapter 1. Let me just go ahead and read some of this. Uh, verse 9, And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, so that's the foundation of it, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Praise God. And so now he begins to talk about the Ephesian believers and how they were chosen and God reached out and worked with their hearts and, and gave them the seal of his spirit that was guaranteeing that they were part of this. And, uh, and so we become God's possession and then this uh, passage we've used so often, I'll just refer to it from uh, fi verse 15 on, which is where he talks about the, his prayer, that we would gain a real understanding, not just an intellectual understanding, but I mean the, the, the eyes of our heart. So it's something we can live as if it were true. Yes. You understand the difference? Yes. Yeah, we don't want people who are simply educated in Christian doctrine. We want, God wants us to have such a, a conviction, a knowledge, that it will fuel a conviction that will enable us to be able to stand. Because if there is doubt, if we are uncertain about his purpose or uncertain about our place in it, we're, we're not going to do much standing, are we? We're going to back down every time. Sorry, Mr. Devil, sorry I bothered you. I mean, we don't say that, but I mean, it's kind of how it works. God help us. But anyway, Paul wanted to just, oh, there was a longing in his heart because he'd seen this, to cause them to understand their place, to understand how great Christ was and the victory that he won when he rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, the place he occupies. He's above everything. But it's not, again, so that he can simply be, wow, Mr. Wow. It's so that he can, he can rule over everything for us. In other words, every enemy you and I have today, everything that we see that's wrong, he rules over that. He rules and he does it for us. 
And he wants us to get that. And so he goes on and he discusses, he, he talks about our place. Now, wh how did we come into this? And the amazing truth is that you and I started out completely dead in sins. We were 100% lost, jailed, imprisoned in a system ruled over by Satan, blinded, just following our natural inclinations. Let me tell you today, if, you, if your life is yours and you're simply living to please whatever desires arise in you, you're part of this that he's talking about. It's a world system that is headed for the fire. And it's only the mercy of God that can pull somebody out of that and, and turn them onto another path. So this is not talking about people finding out about God and saying, oh, I want him. This is God having to do something supernatural to the heart. And so the, the picture here is th that glorious but of verse 4. Because though we were objects of wrath, it says, but because of his great love, certainly not because of anything he found in us, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So what happened when Jesus came forth from the tomb was a whole lot more than just him coming forth from the tomb. He brought forth the whole brand new creation with him because everything of, that was part of that creation was in him. Just as our life, our natural life came from Adam, our spiritual life came from him. He is the progenitor of a great new family that will, well, it's born of a different kind of life that's going to live forever. And so we see, and, and of course we see not only what he's done for us, but we see the, we see the, uh, the, the sit part. Is, this is where this comes in. Because it says, and God raised us up with Christ and, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Does that not make a difference in how we approach spiritual battles? Personally and on behalf of others? What is your position? You know, Ron talked about how prone we are to look at our own infirmities. Well, we are. And that's part of being able to stand is we're going to have to get past that. It's not a matter of saying, oh, none of that matters. It's a matter of what do we do with it. And that's what the gospel is about. The gospel has, has an answer for every situation, every need that we possibly have. We don't have to sit here like paupers and beggars and, oh, God, he couldn't do anything for me. These are glorious truths, but not for me. Boy, once the, if the devil can, can convince us of that, he's won. Because we'll just throw it on our arms and say, I'm sorry, Mr. Devil, you know, like I said, we're not gonna we're gonna not gonna bother you anymore. We're gonna feel like he's up here and we're down here. Our entire mentality is gonna be, I'm a victim, I can't do anything, I can sort of throw up a wish list to God and hope something good happens, but you know, I don't really expect it. You know, my dad used to tell the story about the I guess this was to illustrate faith, but it, it, the uh, illustration of the woman who had, and I've told this before, but there was some tree out in her property somewhere that she didn't like, it was in the wrong place, blocked her view, I don't know what it was. Somehow, it, she, didn't want, she wanted it gone. And she read about moving mountains, so she prayed, oh Lord, move that tree, move that tree, move that tree, and she went to bed, she got up in the morning and looked out and said, just as I expected. <laughs> And that's the problem. Our expectations don't match up with our prayers many times. And, and the, God wants us to see our position in him because if we don't see that we are truly seated with him, if we, th we think ourselves up here in a position of authority, let me tell you something. Devils are afraid, to, are terrified of you. If you know Christ, if he is in your heart, devils are terrified of you because they, they know who's in you. It's not you. Devils are terrified of you. Um, I, I thought about this instant. Maybe Tim will forgive me. Uh, this is Tim in, in South Carolina. Will forgive me for telling this, but uh, I, maybe I've told it before. I can't remember. But um, some of you remember he was a, at one point a school principal. And there was a girl in his school one day who just went out of control. Just nobody could control her. They called her parents to come get her. She was still just absolutely 
berserk out of control. And he recognized what was going on, so he, he took her in the office quietly. And he didn't do any great mumbo-jumbo. He just looked at her and said, look, there's nothing in me, but in the name of Jesus, you be still. Instantly, she was still. Looking up at him, like, I'll tell you, if we understood who lives in us, that he's really greater than he that's in the world, we would pr approach a lot of things differently. We are afraid of things that we don't need to be afraid of. I'll tell you where the fear is coming from. The devil is terrified of you. So he took her by the hand and walked her out, and everybody was just dumbfounded. But, you know, it's a spiritual battle. Our warfare is not against people. Our warfare is against the spirits that work. And we have that. We are the ones with the upper hand. Somehow this is just, I, I guess I'm going to keep coming back to this. But we are the ones who are seated on a throne. We have the authority. We have the upper hand over the devil that works on us, that works on other people that we're concerned about. We're the ones in a position of authority. Do we use that? Do we stand upon that? Do we believe it? I mean, I, I, I'm looking at you and I see me. This, this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and God help us to get it. But, you know, we've got to start somewhere. We've got to proclaim the word and just, and just pray and ask God to make this live and make this real. Because our attitude in battle makes all the difference. Yeah. If we approach it as, look, we have the upper hand, devil, you're going to have to leave. You're going to have to give in. And I'm not giving up. I've got the power. I know I've got the power. I know if the one is in me is greater than you. You have to listen to him. How many of our issues do we approach that way? God help us. You know, we can sit here and sing all the glorious songs and, and profess, you know, that we've got the victory and we've got the victory and, and we go around and it, it, it's not, like, not quite like it ought to be, is it? And God help us. But this is a reality, and so this was the first part of, of Watchman Nee's message because he understood before you can get to the stand part, you better find out who you are and where you're at. If you're down here under the circumstances, you know, that's not where we're meant to be. There are circumstances to be sure, but we don't have to be under them in the sense that they've just defeated us. We are in a position of authority that we need to step up and believe. And I know there's people that run, to, that run amok with this, and there's people that convene conferences and try to cast the devil out of cities, well, they just that's fantasy land. But I mean, within the will and the purpose of God, we can be laborers together with him, and we can take authority where he commands. Jesus didn't drive the devil out of cities. <laughs> In one place, he took a man out of a city and healed him and told him not to go back. You know, we're, we're getting to that place, but I believe God has purposes. He has things that he has given us power to do. He's not going to just magically go out and do stuff. He does it through us. And there's ways that he does it. And I, you know, I just, I, I see my own deficiencies in this area. And it just kind of, it makes me angry at myself. But yet all we can do is walk where we're at on the journey. We just have to grow. We have to learn. But I believe God's heart is, is ready to say, hey, wait a minute. There's stuff I want to do. But I, I, I want to do it through a people. It's, that's the way it works in my kingdom. I've given you everything. I've put you on a throne. What are you doing with it? Are we just sitting back and, and, and doing whatever? God help us. Uh, and so this is the starting point. I mean, you know, you think about some of the pictures in the scriptures of, of people who came to such a conviction of the reality of what, Christ, of what they had in God that they had a heart that was willing to stand up no matter what. Folks, we're going to need that kind of a heart in the hour, any, at any hour of history, but in this hour particularly. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or a CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. DVDs are $10 and CDs are $5. And for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your request to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. 
We invite you to join us again next week at this same time. And may God richly bless you until then.